infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in the U.S. With approximately 300,000 cases reported on an annual basis. It's caused by the spirochetal organism, Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, while the majority of Lyme disease patients can be cured with a two to four week antibiotic regimen, about 10 to 20% of the patients continue to suffer from persisting symptoms. Now, my guest today is the lead author of a study recently published in the journal Antibiotics, which studied testing a group of essential oils to determine their effectiveness against the persistent Lyme bacteria. So joining me now is professor in the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is Ying Zhang, MD, PhD. Dr. Zhang, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you for having me. Now, Dr. Zhang, before we dive into the study, I'd like to talk about some of the terminology. Um, what is a persister form of Lyme bacteria? Yeah, uh, Lyme bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, can develop into uh, different types of persisters. So it's an unusual spirochete bacteria that is different from many bacteria we know about, like uh, E. coli, Staph aureus. So these bacteria all can develop persister form of the bacteria. By persister form, it means that the bacteria are in a dormant state, have low metabolism, and they are not killed by commonly used antibiotics. They are resistant to antibiotics. This is actually more proper term should be tolerant, or uh, it's because it's, they don't have genetic basis to the antibiotics. Uh, and then they are also resistant to a variety of different stresses. And the important thing to realize is that the persister forms actually not really homogeneous. They are rather heterogeneous. They consist of different types. In the context of Borrelia, they're known to develop into different morphological forms, which we show, in fact, are persister forms. For example, round body forms, cyst forms, microcolony forms, as well as biofilm, they are all resistant to antibiotics. In, in fact, the spirochete form itself can become non-growing, can become dormant. They also are type of persister. So it's a very heterogeneous vector population of persisters, and they show different degree of persistence to antibiotics. So it's very complicated, very complex. And it's important to realize that the current Lyme antibiotics used to treat Lyme disease do not kill these forms. So you, you've been researching uh, antibiotics against persister Lyme bacteria for several years now. Are there any antibiotics that work well? Yes, we have screened uh, the FDA-approved uh, drug library and found a range of drug candidates that used for treating other disease conditions, other infections, to be more effective than the current Lyme antibiotics like doxycycline, amoxicillin, cefiroxam. In fact, we found that daptomycin, which is a drug used to treat MRSA, as well as clofazamine, a drug used to treat leprosy, as well as MDRTB, and uh, other drugs to be actually sulfur drugs, artemisinin, etc., to be much more active than the current Lyme antibiotics against the Borrelia persisters. And we show that these persister drugs are important, uh, even though they are more active than the current Lyme antibiotics. When used alone, they have limited activity. We show that they have to be used in the context of drug combination. Uh, we propose this yin-yang model, where the yang means growing bacteria, yin means non-growing bacteria. So when the growing bacteria accumulate to certain stage, grow to certain age, 
they start to develop resistors, the yin form. So you need two types of antibiotics. The antibiotics that kill the growing form of uh, Borrelia bacteria, like the one we use for treating Lyme disease currently, as well as drugs that target the non-growing persister forms, which we identified, like daptomycin, clofazamine, etc. Uh, you need both types of drugs to be used in combination to be more effective to kill these persister forms. And uh, we demonstrated that in vitro. And uh, we're in the process of testing them in vivo. Now, in, in the study that we're uh, talking about today, you use a number of essential oils to test their activity against these stationary stage persisters. Dr. Zhang, what are essential oils, and is there a history of using them as anti-infectives? Yeah, essential oils are volatile uh, oils. They are uh, derived from plants uh, through a process of uh, steam uh, distillation often. And these oils actually can be very potent. Um, they have been used throughout history uh, for a range of conditions, uh, even uh, aromatherapy, uh, a range of other things uh, used as a fragrance, uh, as uh, in the food, and uh, as uh, anti-infectives indeed as well. But they have not been generally accepted by mainstream medicine. Um, is mainly being used as alternative medicine, uh, like uh, herbal medicine, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, as well as using other, uh, you know, ancient medicines uh, from India, from the, you know, other cultures. Uh, they've been used. But then, you know, in generally, uh, they are not really uh, well characterized, not well studied. Uh, so it is quite interesting that we found some of them to be quite active against the Borrelia persister forms. Yeah, and let's uh, go ahead and talk about that. You know, let's talk about your research. How did you and your team perform the study? Yeah, so uh, I went to a Lyme disease conference uh, back in about 2015, 2016. Then a physician uh, from Switzerland was telling me about the amazing effect that she sees in her patients uh, with oregano oil. So I didn't quite believe that. So uh, I thought that could be effect on the host itself or maybe some sort of non-specific effect. So we started uh, testing a range of essential oils um, that are commercially available. So we, we purchased them through different sources and then evaluated them against uh, Borrelia bacterial culture, uh, especially the stationary phase form of the bacteria culture that is known to contain different types of persister forms like uh, round bodies, microcolonies. These are persister forms that are tolerant to or not killed by the current Lyme antibiotics. We use a stationary phase culture, like a 7 to 10 day old stationary phase Borrelia culture in the screening for against, uh, in the first study, we did two studies. In the first study, we evaluated about uh, 34 essential oils, where we found uh, top three candidates to be oregano oil, cinnamon bark oil, as well as uh, clove bud oil. These are very potent. Uh, it's quite surprising that they seem to show better activity than the current Lyme antibiotics. Uh, mm -hmm and uh, also have activity against uh, biofilm forms, probably because they are in this uh, oil form that's lipophilic, that tend to dissolve biofilms. So in the second study, we use the same approach, evaluated another 35 essential oils. Interestingly, we found uh, different uh, essential oil hits. Uh, top five are garlic, allspice, myrrh, lysicubiba, and hydecam. Uh, in addition, we found some others as well, uh, including um, palmarosa, lemon, eucalyptus, cumin, some white, etc. Yeah. So the, these are all quite active. So it's uh, really quite interesting. Um, we're interested to follow up on these uh, lead 
uh, essential oils and uh, further evaluate them in vivo in the mouse model of Borrelia infection. So what, what, do the, what do these findings mean on a practical level? Well, this means that uh, it's, it, it's very interesting to see the remarkable activity of these essential oils on Borrelia persistiformes. This is new. Mm -hmm. Okay, this has not been known before. Um, and especially, their activities seem to be more active than the current Lyme antibiotics. So very excited about this finding. Of course, we, one needs to be careful. I know the potential side effects of essential oils, uh, like you have to use it in a safe manner, of course, uh, because when applied directly, it can be toxic, can cause skin burning, uh, mucosal burning, and uh, needs to be used uh, in a diluted manner. So that's why we're right now in the process of uh, evaluating the doses as well as scheduling. That is how often you give the oil in order to have activity in the animal model to achieve appropriate uh, blood drug concentration. And it's encouraging. There have been some uh, animal studies with other essential oils uh, performed by other groups that show that uh, giving essential oils can achieve uh, appropriate uh, blood drug concentration. Uh, so, but we need to evaluate this more systematically, more carefully, uh, in a manner that really demonstrates this with our uh, top hits more consistently and uh, safely. Have you and your team uh, started this follow-up research yet? Yes, we're in the process of uh, performing this. Uh, it takes time. I know, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest as well as a lot of impatience as well mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, I know you talked about, uh, you asked about this uh, drug combination studies which we published uh, uh, back in 2015. It's about three years ago. You're asking why, you know, we have not seen the results. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, it's not promising. It only means that this is a complicated process, sure. especially we're dealing with a bacteria that is not E. coli or Staph aureus that is easy to deal with, mm -hmm. because the culture is very difficult for Borrelia. As well as uh, in the animal model, it has a very different behavior than common bacteria that cause persistent infections, even tuberculosis. So, uh, because when the disease relapses, you cannot culture the organism. And like in TB infection or other urinary tract infection, you can culture the organism. But in the case of Borrelia infection, even though the disease come back, it, you cannot culture them. That's why uh, it's easy to deny the persistence problem. Um, but then you can detect that. It has been demonstrated in the mouse model by uh, Amir Hotzik and Steve Bassold at UC Davis that you get this resurgence phenomenon. That is, after the treatment, even though initially you don't detect the Borrelia DNA, uh, then, uh, you know, at the end of one year, you started to see the Borrelia DNA uh, resurging. Hmm. That is, uh, re-emerging. Um, you know, you suddenly see uh, increasing Borrelia DNA content by PCR, only by PCR, but not in terms of culture. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a, it's a tricky problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they take the model to evaluate the persistence uh, as well as these drug combinations take more than a year, a year to two years. So that's why, you know, in fact, uh, we are supported by the Cohen Foundation to evaluate these different drug combinations in collaboration with Monica Ambers and uh, Mir Hotzik. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, earlier time points uh, with the drug combinations incorporating the persistent drugs look promising, I must say. So, but of course, this is early time points and uh, we need to follow through. And uh, hopefully next time I'll be able to <laughs> report the progress. That'd be great. Any final thoughts, Dr. Zhang? Yeah, I want to say that this is a complicated disease. It's a very complex disease, and it's important we remain open-minded uh, rather than saying that or thinking that we know everything. 
it is dangerous to have that kind of mindset. Uh, we won't be able to make progress with that. And uh, especially we're dealing with an unusual organism like Borrelia. We have to be open-minded. We have to try all these uh, different approaches, uh, including evaluating these persistent drug candidates in combination. Um, and I know that we need to show this in the animal model first and then move on to clinical trials. And I must say clinical trials are badly needed. And the previous trials have all done with the current Lyme antibiotics, which show some improvement in symptoms, but it's not a cure. So we believe or we think that with incorporation of persistent drugs in the context of drug combination, we may be able to achieve a more stable cure uh, for these patients. But of course, we need the proper uh, clinical studies uh, to demonstrate that. But I uh, am hopeful, and uh, you know, that's but in the process, we need uh, support. We need, uh, you know, uh, collaboration. We need uh, uh, collaboration from different uh, groups, from physicians, from scientists, uh, from people who run the trials, uh, from patients, of course. I know patients suffer badly. And, uh, in fact, I receive email calls from them regularly uh, telling me about uh, their suffering, their persistent Lyme disease problem. And uh, I really feel for them, and uh, we're working hard on this problem. I want to tell them that uh, don't give up. Uh, there is hope. Well, very good. And for listeners that would like to check out the study, I'll go ahead and uh, post a link to it on the website when I publish the podcast. And I want to thank you, Dr. Ying Zhang, for sharing your research with us today. Thank you, sir.